right, well, greetings and welcome to Trinity Bible Church. My name is Bill Gauss, and this is our Sunday School class. Um, we are so glad that you're with us, and if you're a first-time visitor, uh, we do hope that you will uh, uh, th uh, decide to come and join us uh, next week at our church uh, on Lincoln Avenue here in Vineland. Um, and uh, yes, we will be meeting next week. Um, we are finalizing the plans and putting some social distancing uh, uh, requirements in place, uh, as well as masks and all those other things, um, so that we are able to uh, come together and worship once again uh, at the church. And uh, we, we couldn't be happier about that. Uh, we're very much looking forward to it. Uh, of course, for those of you who are uh, not going to be able to join us uh, um, by choice or because of uh, some other reasons, um, mainly being not able to, uh, we totally understand and we will be continuing uh, this ministry to you on YouTube, uh, albeit uh, live at that point. Uh, so we'll be going live next Sunday morning around 9.30 for our Sunday school class. Actually, it'll probably be more like... Uh, quarter of 10, 945, and again at uh, 1045 for our morning worship service. Um, all the services from that point on uh, being next Sunday, uh, the 14th, um, I believe it's the 14th. Let me just uh, double check that real quick. Uh, yes, it'll be uh, the 14th. Uh, all of our services will that from that point on be live broadcasts on our YouTube channel. Uh, so we're getting all of the things finalized for all those things and uh, for, for the meetings. And we do trust that you will pray for us as we um, move forward with all of that and, and also pray for our safety. Um, and uh, today we are looking at uh, Romans chapter 9, verses 20 to 24. And before we dig into the Word of God, let's ask His blessing on our study. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here before you, uh, we uh, take your word seriously. We take it for what it is. It is your word, and we are to obey. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for the minds that you've given us. Uh, we thank you that uh, we uh, can actually study your word, and uh, we, we pray that you will help us to be faithful to it. Uh, Lord, as we study your, your uh, word this morning from the book of Romans, we pray that you would open our hearts and minds that we might uh, be better um, uh, witnesses of your gospel uh, as well as uh, ministers to your kingdom and other Christians and uh, non-Christians alike. Lord, we, we thank you for the ministries that you've given us as they are all important and um, many different parts of the, the, the body of Christ. And Lord, we again thank you for uh, the fact that we can study freely here in the, in the United States. Uh, Lord, bless our study as we go to it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So yes, uh, Romans chapter 9, verses uh, 20 to 24. Uh, let's read that together. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and uh, you can read from whatever version you are comfortable with. Uh, but indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So verses 20 to 21, um, let's just read that uh, briefly here once again to refresh our memory here of what it's saying here. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? It's a question. Uh, will the thing formed, to, uh, formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Uh, I want to look at this passage more closely in light of two theological uh, positions or viewpoints, um, those being supralapsarianism and infralapsarianism. Um, first of all, I know that this may be a bit academic, 
Uh, but I truly believe that understanding the terms surrounding uh, the this these viewpoints, um, it, it's worthy of our time. It, it's worthy of study. Uh, so I can assure you that I'm not being academic for the sake of being academic. Um, these terms matter, and the side we take is very important. It's actually vital. In fact, I'm I'm only bringing it up because this passage speaks to this issue. So. The debate between superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism has to do with the relationship of God's decrees to election and the fall, uh, and particularly the fall. Uh, it's the lapse of the human race into sin, and that's where we get the root of both of those terms, lapsarianism, the lapse into sin. Uh, and then supra and infra deal with God's involvement with the fall and the order of God's decrees uh, uh, with respect to it, the fall, and to election. Okay. Some think that those who hold to the doctrine of infralapsarianism claim that God's decree of election came after the fall, and those who hold to supralapsarianism claim that God's decree of election came before the fall. However, this is not correct. Okay? Both sides understand that God's decrees regarding election and reprobation are rooted in eternity. Okay? Uh, God did not issue a decree to save people as a plan B that would be as if his original purpose in creation had been ruined by uh, Adam and Eve's sin. In other words, God did not have to clean up the mess of the fall by coming up with a plan of salvation. Uh, both sides agree that God's sovereign plan of salvation was determined before the foundation of the world, uh, before Adam and Eve even existed. Uh, the question is not when the decrees were, 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 were put in motion by God in his eternal plan, but rather the order of the decrees okay so again the question is not when the decrees were put in motion by god in his eternal plan but rather the order of his decrees so just so you know up front uh, we believe that the infralapsarian position is the most biblical okay um, and it's also held by the vast majority of Orthodox Christians, regardless of whether they know it or not. Um, um, it, it just is what it is. And what I mean by that is whether or not you know of these terms even existing. Uh, I can tell you at Trinity Bible Church, you are an infralapsarian, and, uh, uh, it, whether you know it or not. Okay. Uh, when God makes... Um, uh, when God makes from one batch of clay vessels fit for destruction and, an, and, and from another lump of clay vessels fit for honor, it does not mean that he planned from eternity to make some people bad and other people redeemable. All right, let me say that again. When God makes from one batch of clay vessels fit for destruction and from another batch of clay, vessels fit for honor. It does not mean that he planned from eternity to make some people reprobates and other people redeemable. Okay, God applies his redeeming grace to a mass of humanity completely dead in sin and trespasses. The decree of electing grace is made in light of the fall. In fact, if it were not made in light of the fall... It would not be a decree of grace. On the other side of the coin is the supra-lapsarian position, which teaches that God decreed the fall in light of his doctrine of election. In other words, God first elected certain people to salvation and others to reprobation. And in order to accomplish that eternal purpose, he decreed the fall of humanity. The purpose of the fall was to provide the necessary clay, uh, in this way, people, right, for God to choose some to salvation and others to reprobation. 
uh, supralapsarians say that God planned to save some and condemned others. And in order to make that possible, he decreed the fall of the whole world. Therefore, the purpose of the fall was to provide the conditions that would make it possible for God to show both his grace and wrath. Uh, it's problematic, all right? Super, superlapsarianism is problematic because it contradicts Scripture uh, plainly and blatantly. Uh, God tells us in the Bible that he is not the author or creator of sin. Uh, God does not choose to create people in a fallen condition so that he can condemn them to eternal damnation. God doesn't force people to sin and then punish them for that sin. Uh, for a moment, allow me to tell you what I think, all right? I do not believe that God creates people wicked and then punishes them for their wickedness. And I base that belief because of what Paul is teaching right here in Romans chapter 9, in this passage we're studying this morning. At the same time, I do believe that Augustine was right when he said that God, in some sense, did ordain the fall. Uh, there are two reasons, by the way, why I believe that God, in some sense, ordained the fall. Uh, God's sovereignty is one reason. Uh, God is sovereign over nature and all of human history. Uh, he rules all things by his power and authority. Uh, he is sovereign over the disposition of his grace. Um, nothing can happen apart from God's sovereign action. If I plan to steal a car tonight, my evil intentions might be a secret to the car's owner, but he plan he knows my plans. Um, they're not hidden from him in any way. Uh, he knows what I'm going to do before I do it, and he knows what I'm going to say before I say it. Before a word is even formed in my mind, he knows it all. Okay, And that comes from Psalm chapter 139, uh, verse 4. Uh, and many, many other places in Scripture, especially the book of Psalms. God knows our intentions, even though others might not know them until we tell them. Uh, God, going back to my example here, God has the power to stop me from stealing that car. But does he have the authority to stop me? Yes, he does. God has the authority and the power to prevent anything from happening that does. God can exercise his authority and power and sovereignty by stopping something from happening or by not stopping uh, something from happening. In every way, God always has those options. Uh, since the fall happened, God knew it was going to happen, and he could have prevented it, but he chose not to. His purpose in not stopping it, however, was not to provide himself with some wicked batch of clay to send to hell as reprobates. Why God allowed it is something that no human being can ever fully know. Okay, This is up to God. Uh, the answer Scripture gives is that somehow the lapse of human beings into sin which produced a batch of fallen humanity, uh, this corrupt clay, was for his glory. That's the only answer we have. It was all for his glory. And ultimately, the Bible says that all things are working towards his glory. So moving on to verse 22. I hope I was clear enough with, with those two things. And by the way, there's also a, a third option, a sub-lapsarianism, um, uh, but I, I'm not going to go there. It's, it's very closely related to infralapsarianism. All right, so Paul addresses the, the, the question to the Roman Christians, and, and by extension, he's talking to us, of course. Uh, verse 22, What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Uh, would there be anything wrong with a just and holy God displaying his power and wrath? We might struggle with that idea because we live in a culture that has rejected any idea of a wrathful God. Uh, but Paul refuted that idea already back in Romans chapter 1 when he said in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed 
from heaven against all un- ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It is revealed, whether you like it or not. It is there. When God was going to visit his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham asked him, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and spare, not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? That comes from Genesis chapter 18, 23, and 24. Um, and right away, we should note that Abraham was uh, um, really in heretical territory uh, by suggesting uh, the possibility that God would punish innocent people. Um, it's blasphemous. Um, Abraham came to his senses and said to God, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous would be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Verse 25. Uh, Abraham had no idea how far it is from God to do such a thing. Right? Uh, The distance between the likelihood of God's punishing innocent people with the guilty or righteous people with the wicked is as it's an infinite distance. Uh, In fact, it's absolutely unthinkable that God would do such a thing. And when we see Paul talk about God showing his power, uh, his wrath for vessels fit for destruction and dishonor, uh, we should never think, never think that God punishes innocent people uh, or find or, or that he finds fault uh, with the faultless. OK, uh, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Uh, it is right for the judge of all the earth to show his wrath. It is. Uh, we may not like his wrath. Uh, we may be very uncomfortable with the idea of it. Uh, but when we really think about it, it shouldn't take us long to realize that it is absolutely just for a holy God to show his anger against sin. Remember what we studied from the Gospel of John uh, a while ago on uh, Sunday nights. We're going through the Gospel of John. Um, and this was a while ago. Uh, he made a rope of cords. This is Jesus made a rope of cords. He went into the temple in Jerusalem, kicked over the tables, and drove out the money changers in uh, really a fit of rage. Uh, it was a it was a demonstration of justifiable anger. It's holy and righteous anger. Uh, every time the New Testament mentions the last judgment, it shows everyone standing before the judgment seat of God with their mouths shut. The whole world is guilty before God. A Christian fen, uh, friend of mine uh, and I were, 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 were talking about the coronavirus at the beginning of this pandemic. <clears throat> uh, he was and continues to be nervous. Um, uh, he's the nervous type, right? And I've been the opposite uh, since the lockdowns began. Um, uh, so when he was talking about his concerns about getting this virus, uh, I half-jokingly said to him, uh, What's the matter, bro? Um, don't you believe the sovereignty of God? And without skipping a beat, he said to me, Bill, that's my problem. I do believe in the sovereignty of God, and I know that he would be perfectly just to give me the virus. That's why I'm nervous. Uh, In a moment, my whole outlook on the situation changed. I was reminded of this truth. Um, He was right And I haven't been as carefree in my own life ever since. And I thanked him for helping me to see that perspective, meaning like God is sovereign and just to show his wrath. Um, Yes, yes, we should take delight in our salvation, um, but we should still fear God. And I'm not only talking about fearing God in this uh, sense of like awe and reverence, Uh, Maybe you're like me. Sometimes I experience the stone-cold fear of provoking God to wrath. I do. Uh, I know that my salvation isn't on the line, but I do, however, experience his discipline from time to time, and that is his corrective wrath. And when I get a proverbial spanking from God, it is always just and good. Uh, Paul wants us to consider that here. 
Uh, we don't enjoy being corrected, but we can't find fault in God for wanting to show his wrath in order to make his power known. The writer of Psalms 2 paints this picture of a conference, uh, some kind of like a, a, a grand meeting uh, with the most powerful rulers in the world um, uh, who are present there. And they come together and they conspire against the Lord and his anointed. And they declare their independence and autonomy from God. Uh, they say, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Uh, how does God respond? He laughs. The Lord mocks them and holds them accountable. And if we had all the power in the world, plus all the nuclear weapons on earth, and tried to aim them at heaven, it would accomplish absolutely nothing. Nothing. No one can stand against God's power. But in the foolishness of our sin and the hardness of our hearts, we sin on a daily basis. And then when we get away with it, we assume that God can't do anything about it. Uh, and that's the dumbest thing any creature could assume. It's absolutely true that God is patient and merciful. But as history has proven over and over again, he does remind us that he is sovereign from time to time. God's sovereignty in election is revealed, verse 23, so that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Uh, the treasure of God's glory is compared here to riches uh, that can never quite be counted. Um, and that's what the doctrine of election is all about. Please understand me. This is what this doctrine is all about, the riches of his glory. Uh, although predestination certainly involves God, God's sovereignty, as in his omnipotence and omniscience, in the end, the doctrine is about the riches of God's glory. At the conclusion of this section, by the way, uh, Paul breaks out into doxology. This is chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, uh, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So if you're still struggling to embrace this doctrine of election, it might help you to contemplate the riches of God's glory. And I say that from personal experience because doing so helped me to see how wonderful this doctrine actually is. In the end, this teaching screams not so much the sovereignty of God as it does the unfathomable grace and mercy of God. Uh, more than any other, this doctrine reveals that grace really is amazing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. We sing that hymn not because we're searching, but because the hound of heaven found us with the beauty of his mercy and grace. This is why we talk about doctrines like justification and election as the doctrines of grace. Grace is the whole idea here in the passage today and in the passages we've been studying and in every passage that speaks of election in Scripture. From a corrupt mass of clay, God chose to make vessels of glory. So if you're in Christ Jesus today, this is what God has done for you in His mercy and grace. He has made you a vessel of mercy that He prepared before the foundation of the world for glory. We are bound from God's eternal plan for eternal glory in his family, verse 24, even us whom he called, not only the Jew, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So to support the riches of this mercy and really the central emphasis on grace, Paul goes back to the prophet Hosea. And we'll look at this more next week, but I want to introduce it today. Um, the lesson of mercy and grace that God taught Israel through the prophet Isaiah uh, uh, Hosea cost Hosea a lot of personal pain and suffering. Uh, in order to show the mercies of his glory and the sweetness of his mercy, God commanded Hosea to marry a prostitute who was blatantly promiscuous and deliberately unfaithful. The children that came from their marriage received the judgment of God. Hosea 1 verses 8 and 9 says, When she had weaned Lo-Ruhamah, 
and she conceived and bore a son. And God said, Call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. This is an object lesson, uh, an object lesson of divine rejection. God told the nation of Israel that because of their sinfulness, they had become Loami, not my people. Paul then introduces a, a motif that he'll develop through the remainder of chapter 9 and into chapters 10 and 11. Uh, he is now going to show that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and call a people who were not his people. Paul's talking about us. We who were no people are now his people by his grace. We are the wild olive branch that's grafted into the root of the tree. We don't bring anything to the table. Nothing in us could move God to include us in his kingdom. Our only hope is Christ and the riches of his glory and mercy. Again, that's what election is all about. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our study this morning. Uh, again, this is our Sunday school class. We hope that you'll join us at 1045 for our morning worship service. Uh, we are really blessed that you're here with us. And uh, we hope you'll join us again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our Bible study, our midweek Bible study. And we'll see you here again uh, live starting next Sunday on June 14th. All right. God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you then.